Test. <laughs> Stefan L. <laughs> Where is that? Why is my Stefan L. <laughs> what is happening? Gosh. Here we go. There he is. <laughs> wow. Wow. Just beautiful. beautiful. Just fails all around. Fails all around. But that's all right. <laughs> all right. Welcome, Stefan. Thank you so much for being here. I, I truly appreciate it. Uh, you. No problem. Uh, I, I don't know if you were listening to any of that, but uh, I want to know how accurate AI was. Was AI accurate? I think it was pretty accurate. Okay. <laughs> I was just going to say, like, uh, the only thing was, um, I am I play in the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra, and uh -huh. so um, I'm actually a section member of that orchestra, but sometimes I also am um, guest principal, et cetera. So you did a pretty good job on that one. <laughs> Almost. Well, I actually did do a little research, but it, Morby, welcome in. Welcome in. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um yeah, no. I, the the community knows that I, I'm uh I, I've been freaking out about this AI thing because I don't do like compositions, but I do write. Uh, I I do well. I do. I guess it is composition, but I, I write for artists, so it's not necessarily uh, scoring or anything, but. An artist, like I don't know, and I'm sure you've dealt with this before. They'll maybe send you like a melody on their that they record on their iPhone, and it's like, okay, something like this, yeah. and they're like, now make that into something. And so mm -hmm. I work on that <laughs> level, <clears throat> but but it is still, it's you know, I, I think it's a really interesting job. I love doing that. Uh, but are you concerned as someone who is a composer doing film and stuff? Are you concerned about artificial intelligence? Um, taking your job. Are you concerned about that at all? Man, this question comes up a lot. I'm sure um, it does. I, yeah, recently. I feel, I don't know, I don't I don't feel too concerned by it. I think that AI is a great way to be able to use um, it as a resource for inspiration. Hmm. Um, I do see that there can be conflicts later on down the line when it comes to licensing and details or it's stealing, you know, mm -hmm. basically your blueprint of how you construct things. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's still going to miss that human quality that mm -hmm. humans bring to recording music or performing it live. So I think it, over time it will have to get to that level. But at the moment, I'm not too concerned. <laughs> Yeah, at the moment, it's pretty infantile in it. But, I mean, it's still advanced. I mean, my God, have mm -hmm. you seen anything, that the, the new thing that Google has released, the music? Uh, I don't know if I've seen. No, I don't know if I've seen that. All right, well, here we go. This is, <laughs> okay, hold on. Let, let me just pull up another. Oh, let me get you straightened out here. Uh, oh, and by the way, everybody, this is Stefan. In, in the chat, I'm going to drop Stefan's link, so make sure y'all go follow him up and go listen to the new Batman soundtrack that just was released on in April. So go and check yeah. it out. Let me see. Oh my God, you're really going to make me do this? Twitch? <laughs> I can't even <laughs> drop in my own chat right now. Uh, I don't have any mods in here, do I? Um... Hold on, let me get you straight. Well, what is it called? Maybe I can look it up on my end. Oh, well, I got you. I'm just, I'm just okay. upset. I can't drop your links in the chat. That's all. Got it. I will do okay. it though eventually here, and boom, and I'll just do it man. Oh, I can't do it manually. I'm such a dork. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> let's. Okay, so here's like a quick t TikTok, and I don't know if you can see that. How well you can see it? Yeah. But, I can. Uh, oh, and I'm gonna have to share this with you because you won't be able to hear it. Um, tab, let's go, boom. All right, so check this out. This is, this is, this is wild. Um, oh, geez, it kicked you down here. There we go. Uh, all right. I just told Google's text to music AI tool, Music LM, to make lo fi music, but for an epic fantasy video game. And here is what it generated with AI. <laughs> Here's another one. The AI kind of had trouble with it, but I think it's cool. USSR music in the style of chiptune. Here we go. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> this was just That's released. Strange. And and obviously there is some it needs work, right? And it's yes, it's at the ground ground level, but we are now at the at that level where it's text to text to sound, right? Text to a file that you can download and start using right now for your short film. For and, and this is right now. And and it mm-hmm. might not be the greatest, and I don't know what the usage uh with the user contract or what was that called? The usage like licensing. Yes. Agreement? I don't know what that is going to be because we're already having problems, right? With uh, people with AI kind of scraping the internet and coming up with people's images and then sort of repurposing them into different, you know, uh, things that people are, uh, are, are trying to, you know, create, but, uh, you know, how, how is this going to go? How is this going to translate? And, and we're already here, where do you think it's going to go here in the next couple of years? Hmm. I don't know. Like what I listen to now, I think it's, I think it is very bare bones. Hmm. Um, I think it is, I think it's cool technology, but as far as like being able to, I mean, a lot of film music is about telling the narrative of the scene. And so a, a, many points of that is sinking things down to, you know, a specific point in the scene and carrying the emotion that way. Um, so I guess you could use text to be able to type in the time code and be like, you know, hit this moment here, hit this moment there. But as far as like synced moments of like narrative emotion, I feel like it's gonna have to have a lot more advancement to be able to be used as like a standard application for film. I think it's fine as like a blanket or let's say the directors are trying to find an idea for the composer. Maybe they can go on there and type mm. in something and get the sound. And then the composer can go from there and build their own original work. Uh, that's similar to a synth- like similar to how we use temp music, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. We'll see what happens, but I'm not too worried. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> After what I just heard now, I'm not too worried. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I don't know if that's a hair flip moment. Or, I don't know. He, but, um, he said that was garbage, folks. Yeah. Well, here's the interesting <laughs> thing. So here's like the breakdown of it. And what what's interesting is is that you can prompt it. You can prompt it with a um, uh, a melody that you hum. Like you can hum it, and then and then it'll sort of uh, interpret it as whatever. You can put in, uh, you can, con- it's called conditioning. You can condition it with images. And so I wonder what oh, this, wow. oh, hold on. Let me, let me share this. Uh, so you can hear it too. I don't know if it's going to, mm-hmm. all right, boom. Uh, so this is off of uh, Salvador Dali's uh, A Patience and Memory painting. So this is. I mean, that's okay, right? Was this mm-hmm. Napoleon crossing the Alps? <laughs> Very interesting take. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Like On these images, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. It sounds like crap. Yeah, I agree, Movie Dutchman, but this is... <laughs> I think it's just very electronic based. Right. So if, if there's people who are looking for that score, that type of sound, uh, then they may be a little worried. Um, but as far as like orchestral composers, um, I think they have a lot of uh, things to do before it will reach that level. Yeah, I feel you. I, feel I haven't it. heard anything like really fully orchestral yet. Right, right. There's nothing really that that's like, wow, that's a lush sound and and like yeah (laughs) yeah, i mean like because when you look at where midi's at now right midi is uh is crazy right now like what you can do with midi and and orchestras and stuff like that i I think that's what that's like the industry standard at this point i mean for like more maybe lower budget movies is people composing on midi isn't that that's Mm -hmm. correct right like from your perspective yeah i mean it it depends on you know the production uh like the budget and also the timeline you know so like for instance for batman we didn't have um 
a lot of time to be able to for me to create the score and then record it mm. and then you know mix master deliver so in that time everything you hear in the soundtrack which i think clocks in somewhere around an hour and 27 minutes of music which is insane yeah it was all like recorded performed by me and programmed by me uh, right. none of it was live orchestra right which a lot of people are very surprised by so exactly it just depends on so many factors right and and i, I feel like money and budget is a huge factor in that because paying a uh, paying an orchestra to record you know you're not you're not you're not just paying someone to compose now you're paying each individual musician uh, you know whatever kind of uh uh what what is it the uh, uh union stuff you know like there's so much more yeah. to it when you have a whole live orchestra rather than like let's just get stefan to just put this together in a midi uh, and just because it sounds beautiful it still sounds huge it sounds lush it sounds like and uh so you were also talking about uh <laughs> Uh, uh, you're also talking about, you know, time stamps, time prompts and stuff. So you can actually prompt it to do different things at different times. So you can be like, okay, at oh, wow. 50... yeah, we're already there. I'm just curious. Time to meditate. And at 15 seconds, it's supposed to change to something else. Time to wake up. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> they even got voices that say nonsense, but that's... I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, gibberish. You know, and okay, so here's like a jazz song, because the jazz doesn't sound terrible. feel like i'm in a sims jazz lounge yeah exactly <laughs> so so i mean I, I i mean i i agree with you right now this is you know super basic and i mean you could technically use this stuff now i mean if you're a you know a, a filmmaker who doesn't have much of a budget or you know like like zero budget you know you could go and you know do this but I could see tech, you know, down the road, and when we're talking about you know these huge productions, I mean, the budget still matters. But it's the yeah. the the idea that well, if we could just cut out the music, paying the musicians and and the composer, uh, we could have more money for visual effects or to get you know Johnny Depp to play somebody or something, you know, something. So so it's just such a. Um, I don't know, man. There's a lot. There's a lot to it, and uh, I, I I just don't know where it's going. And again, like you know, I'm I'm also I'm also here on the chopping block because I write for artists and stuff too. So, it it's it's one of those things I feel like people could just go. It, it like in in a couple of years, I feel like people could just it will be at a point where. You know why are we paying the musicians now? It's like it, <laughs> no, and, and it's funny too because because when you look at like BuzzFeed, uh, you you know BuzzFeed is a news outlet. Mm -hmm. They just eliminated their whole news um, news department along with MTV News as well, and now they're using AI generated articles. <laughs> so wow. they eliminate entire entire swaths of the company of writers. And then they're replaced with AI writing, chat GPT. So there are like this is already being instituted into these different, uh, you know, these different, uh, uh, you know, art forms. So I don't know. I to me, it's fu it's scary. It's, it's very scary to me. And um, I, I don't know. I know there's no reason to be freaking out right now. But there, there does seem to be something down the road that that is waiting for us. I, uh, yeah, I guess we'll see what happens, you know. I Like I said, um, as far as practical use for composers, I think it'll be excellent for establishing mm -hmm. tone 
and and you know just discourse with the directors and producers to be able to like get ideas over to them quickly so you can extrapolate that or extrapolate that and, mm. and create something custom and unique yes. for the production you know but mm. as far as like you know feeding something in there you know bouncing it out and be like here is the cue for approval i don't think that's going to happen in time <laughs> so not based off of what i heard you know well yeah i mean, it, I mean yeah. this last thing here says string quartet with violins which i was uh -oh. kind of intrigued to hear what Let, they did let's, epic movie soundtrack with drums let's see let's go let's go Let's see if I'll shoot myself in the foot. <laughs> I, I doubt it, but <laughs> but still, again, we're we're talking about something that's in its infancy, so it's like mm -hmm. we we still don't know where this is all gonna go. So let's yeah. check out this uh, string quartet with violins into epic movie soundtrack with drums. Oh my god! Sorry, guys. That's pretty crappy so far. <laughs> and as we suspected, no. it's like, no. yeah, I got, it's not got work. some work. It's got some work. It's got a lot of work. I agree. I agree. It, it, the, the weird thing about it all is that we just we don't know where it's so mushy yeah it's so mushy i agree um we just don't know where it's going really you know what i mean like we did like like 30 years ago when we were kids we were thinking of like video phone would be awesome right to be able to look at people on your phone on on your phone at home because we didn't have cell phones uh you, you know like yeah i could talk to to adrian and, and, and see him and moving around we didn't think that that would be something that was possible where you're actually carrying it around with you in your pocket you know so we don't un we, we yeah. don't really understand where the technology is actually going to go anyways so it, it's like mm -hmm. it's so hard to predict what's going to happen because it's such a, um, I mean, it's just such an open-ended uh, situation. Like, I don't know. What it really to... depends on the creator, too, or, you know, if you want to use creator, but the person feeding the material. Right. In because the more the more advanced or, you know, the better they get with feeding that material and the better the output could be. So who knows? There could be someone who figures out the correct syntax to create a masterpiece. Right. But um, you still need quality source material to gather that. And right now, everything kind of sounds a little lo-fi and, and not really production ready uh, to put out there on the screen. Yeah. You know? I, I absolutely agree. So. Yeah, that that was terrible. That string quartet. <laughs> I was like, I was like, where's the strings? I don't I hear know. them, but okay. I know. Oh, that was uh, anyway, <laughs> but um, yeah, man. So you, you're Midwest, and uh, well, Midwest. You're from the Midwest, and then uh, and then you went out to at Los Angeles. Uh, what what took you out to LA, and and why? And I, I lived in San Diego for about 15 years, and I worked in L.A., you know, not all the time, but a good amount of time. So I have a little bit of, you know, cursory idea of how that works. But it, it's uh, I, I was never comfortable in Los Angeles until until I left, actually, it's when I started getting more comfortable as a person, I started getting way more comfortable with Los Angeles. I lived there for a couple months, but. What drew you out there? Why, why, why LA? Why not New York? Well, I mean, for film music and commercial music in general, I just feel like the place where everything starts is in LA. Yeah. You know, artists live here, producers, music supervisors, the studios are here, directors are here. And there's tons of events going on all the time that allow you to meet people on a friendship level to create connections that you would not be able to do anywhere else in the world. Um, so I knew that if I wanted to become a film composer and doing, uh, you know, more studio film level projects that I needed to move to LA. And originally, you know, I started as a violist, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, all my life playing viola since I was like 
eight or nine years old and then went to school for that. And when I came out here, I went to a program called the Henry Mancini Institute. Mm. Um, and it was basically a program that had an orchestra. Everyone who's accepted got a full scholarship for the month. And we just lived in L.A. and we like recorded on soundtracks and played blues and jazz and classical, like every genre you can imagine. And I was just like, man, this is really awesome. Like, I want to live in a place where I could like play Beethoven one week and the next week I'm playing with Rihanna. Like, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. You can't you can't do that in Chicago. Yeah. Um, and you can kind of do it in New York. But New York is just too many people, too crowded and and just you know, over concentrated when it comes to um, the amount of people there and the amount of work. It's not a lot of work for everybody in New York versus L.A. There's much more here and just more diverse work. So I just knew that if I wanted to get into the studios um, and start writing for film, that I would focus on my playing. Um, and then I won a job in the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra that opened up the doors to playing um, on all the motion picture soundtracks and video game soundtracks and TV stuff, and also meeting other composers, directors, producers, and stuff like that. And so, and I just decided to stay, but the first five years were rough in LA. In which as way? everyone will tell you. In which way? It's finding your footing, you know? Like mm. if I moved here, I didn't really have a huge network. I didn't have a job and I was just going uh, to LA for a grad school. And so at least I had something to do mm. when I came here. I know a lot of people move here on a whim, like, you know, fuck it. I'm moving to LA and we're going to make this shit happen. Yeah, right. And then they end up becoming a server, you know? So it's like, you have to make sure that you have things set up for you to be successful before you move to the place. You can't just jump there and expect things to blow up. So luckily I had grad school and that was a feeder into other areas and helping me network with other people. Um, so it was just kind of the slow incline. But it took it took a good five years to really develop a good network here to where consistently I was working as a musician. So if you do move here, give it at least five years. Mm. You can't you can't live here for like a year or less and and expect that you're going to be doing big time work. It's you know, as well as I know, the whole industry is built on trust, hmm. who you know, and you could be as talented as all hell, but if they don't know who you are and they've never worked with you, chances are you're not going to get called. Because right. uh, sometimes other people who may not be as talented as you get the call because they know them, yeah. you know? So your job is to get to know everybody so you can become the man that everyone calls when they need something. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's how uh, I view it. Edgar Edgar says you got a clean fade. You got a clean fade. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Got it done recently. <laughs> well, no, Thanks. yeah, it's it, man. Uh, the amount of times I've seen where, you know, you know, I don't like to judge musicians and stuff too much. Everybody's at their own level, wherever they're at in their life. But but when you are seeing someone who's like not even <laughs> half as talented as you are, and you're like, they got the gig. They got it. Like, <laughs> this is, it's, it's a, uh, it, it is frustrating. But like you said, it, it's because they know people, they made the right connections or <laughs> nepotism, whatever it is, you know, it's, it's finding your way through that weird maze to get to the people. Do you still, uh, do you still work with, or do you still network with some of the people you graduated with? Um, yeah, I feel like, we end up working all the time. You know, mm -hmm. some of them I'll see on recording sessions in the studios or um, live performance stuff. Um, you know, once you once you finish school, depending on how you want to proceed, some people end up staying in LA because they love the versatility of work. Some people are die hard, like die hard classical, so they want to go play in a full time symphony orchestra, and that's what they want to do for the rest of their lives. So it people decide what's their trajectory and then from there they do the appropriate things to secure work and you know in freelance it's not a tenure position it's all based on your own you know work ethic and so if you if you're a lazy person then don't do it <laughs> you know because you're gonna work 24 7 yeah you know it, there's no such thing as a nine to five yeah. when it comes to freelance music 
Right, yeah. right. It, it, and that's what, you know, people don't understand. It's like, it, I was kind of griping at the beginning. It's like, man, I need to start working for myself again uh, because I don't like to be on other people's schedule. But it doesn't mean that I wasn't working mm-hmm. really hard because you're constantly, mm-hmm. what's next? What's the next thing? And it's like, you're working, you're in the middle of a project and you're talking about something that you're going to schedule down the road because you want something lined up yeah. afterwards. Because you got to eat, you got to pay rent or, you know, house payments, whatever mm-hmm. it is. It, it, it is tough. It is tough. You know, do mm-hmm. you do you find that people who only concentrate on, like, I, I only want to be an orchestral musician and that's it. I don't want to, you know, do studio work or anything else. Do you find that they find a, a good amount of success where they can do that full time? Or do you think it's something where you kind of got to hustle? Because I, I, L.A., well, Southern California in general is just a very expensive place to live. And, you know, there's mm-hmm. people who, who are, you know, who are making, who are on TV shows who are still struggling because they're just trying to uh, maintain maybe a lifestyle or maybe a, uh, you know, just their basic rents and needs. Um, do mm-hmm. you find that people who concentrate on just, you know, being an orchestral musician as opposed to like someone like you who is like, you know, I, I, I compose, I perform, I, you know, I, I teach or whatever it is on the side, uh, do you find that they f- struggle more or, or do you, f- are there people, I'm sure there's people out there who just do that and are fine and are making great money, but you know, as someone just getting into it. I think, um, well, getting a full-time orchestra job is like winning a medal in the <laughs> Olympics. Like, let's be honest, right. you know, like um, many people, they go to conservatory or whatever, and they're like, I want to be a world famous soloist, but I'm sorry if you haven't been a soloist by the age of 16, it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> so your, your realistic routes as a classical musician is going to be playing in an orchestra, whether it's full time or regional orchestra or doing your own thing, you know, mm-hmm. playing freelance, teaching, like you were saying, anything like that. So, um, the, I would say the percentage of people who actually win a full-time orchestra job is probably the top two to three percent mm. out of everyone who's playing in classical music. Um, and, you know, those jobs range. L.A. Phil is one of the highest paid orchestras in the United States. I think, don't quote me, but I think they last time I checked, it was like 160 k a year for for section like violin to back of the second violins <laughs> starting salary is $160,000 a year, wow. you know, but you, there may be one chair open and 300 people show up for right. that all around the world. So you're competing with all those people to get that one chair. And after you win that spot, you still have, you're still on probation for up to two years. So you could, you could be in that spot for two years and the section and the music director could decide that you're not a good fit and let you go and you're thrown right back out into the audition pool again to do it all over so i've played with professional um you know top professional orchestras and stuff fortunately is like a sub because it allows me to be able to have the freedom to do other things if i was playing in a 52-week season orchestra i wouldn't have time to score films or do arrangements or or play in recording session stuff um And so to me, I like that versatility. It keeps me driven. And also it keeps me charged when I go back to my studio and write uh, because I'm just constantly surrounded by different ideas. So I would say the perfect route for a classical musician is not the full-time orchestra gig. If you want that stability, that's great. And if you're talented enough and consistent enough as a player to be able to win that job, then do it. But if you want to have a well-rounded musical experience, I highly recommend freelance, but it's not easy and you have to put in the work. Um, And it takes a long time, you know, it takes a long time. But the more people you meet, the more people call, Hmm. you know? So um, now I'm in a position where I have to say no to a lot of stuff, but that was like 15 years of just grinding, (laughs) right? you know? So, um, that, so yeah, that ability to say no <laughs> is like getting to that spot is awesome. Like, it's just like, yeah. I just can't, like, I don't have enough time, <laughs> which is a beautiful thing. Um, Edgar wants to know how much they pay to play the triangle, which is percussion. And I'm <laughs> guessing that it's probably a decent wage. I mean, cause... hey, they probably make some good money because, mm-hmm. I mean, percussionists get doubles, you know, uh, if it's a union. 
So uh, if they're playing more than one instrument, especially like recording sessions, oh. they're playing more than one instrument. They get paid for, you know, I think each instrument or at least a chunk of each instrument. Wow. So sometimes the percussionists are making more than I make <laughs> when we're uh, on recording sessions <laughs> Wow! <laughs> because they're playing three instruments, you know, at the same hmm. time in a cue. Right, right. So, I didn't even think about that. That, that phew, yeah. There you go. Well, there you go. go Edgar. AFM. <laughs> Edgar, get out there and, and start triangle and, and maybe play the <laughs> timpani too. I don't know. Maybe the tambourine as well. Yes. Get, get paid in the shade, yeah. sir. Uh, so uh, this, uh, the, the Batman thing is really cool, man. And I haven't gotten to see the movie, but I, I do enjoy Batman and, uh, uh, but the music, man, I'm totally getting Elfman vibes off it, man. I know there's been few, uh, 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 a few different composers that's worked with Batman, but like the Danny Elfman, I think is the, the with the, because he did with uh, uh, Burton, right? He was the Tim Burton composer. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, those that that music itself. I mean, just that opening, you know, when you're going through the bat, you know, the shape of the Batman, uh, the bat signal thing, the thing on your shirt, you know, just yeah. that opening. It, it's, yeah. it's it's amazing. Um, it, it, I don't know. Like, uh, did you did you have any inspiration from Elfman? Uh, like, how did you start working? How, how did you? Okay, so how did you? Uh, yeah. Well, please go into. Uh, how you got the gig and uh and then we'll talk about how you, what what sort of inspired the choices you made okay um so how i got the gig so back in what was it 2020 everyone stuck at home mm. uh studios are closed and everything like that so there was this app where some of you may have heard of it clubhouse oh yes uh that was going around like crazy and so that was one of the one times in the Hollywood universe that you could actually connect with people uh, without a middleman uh, because everyone was on that damn app because they're bored, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, on, there was a conversation that they were having about just diversity inclusion behind the lens, which I think is very important uh, that Hollywood acknowledges that there's talent that isn't just, you know, let's just say it white <laughs> and that people, you know, and also behind the lens. So, you know, they, a lot of times Hollywood likes to put forward, you know, uh, uh, people of color as directors, producers and things. But when it comes to composers or, or, you know, editors or things like that, they don't really think about that. They stick to their typical crew of people that they know and trust, like we were talking about. Right. So that conversation came up and I, basically put my virtual hand up and went on stage and there were a lot of pretty big directors, producers um, on the stage listening. And I just told them about my experience being in the orchestra, um, you know, looking in the booth and not seeing anyone that really looks like me or anyone in the orchestra looks like me or anyone on the podium. And many times being, you know, one of only maybe three black musicians on the stage uh, consistently. Um, and that really hit, home for a lot of people that were listening and so my agent um well my agent now actually heard that and hit me up and emailed me and was like i want to represent you and oh. then several directors hit me up they were like hey we want to chat and then uh later on down the line the director sam Liu for uh batman and producer he hit me up i think it was sometime around 1 30 in the morning or something because we're both night owls and mm -hmm. he was like i want to talk to you about something he's like how would you like to score the new animated batman i'm like holy shit yes <laughs> of course so it, it was literally like everyone says being at the right place at the right time yeah. you know you can't plan these things but one thing that was in common what was i doing networking mm -hmm. Always networking, yeah. and and also yeah. and also having the the ability to to back it up as well, right? Because yeah. there's, mm -hmm. there's a certain amount of luck, but there's also a certain amount like you need that skill to back that up. Uh, and yeah. and you already had some f films and stuff under your under your belt, right? So like the, the yeah. director was able to look at your your portfolio. I guess that's what you call it, and yeah. and be like, <laughs> and, uh, and it would be like, okay, this guy can can do it. Uh, mm. So that is wild, man. That is so wild. Clubhouse, and it's funny how fast that sort of came and went. Um, I know it's it's 
pretty much garbage now. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think having the ability to back it up, obviously, you can't just be all talk and then it sounds like crap, you right. know? So like production quality has to be good. Um, but this was like my first studio film release. So it, it it's, you know, it's a lot of trust that Warner Brothers yeah. in DC had to have in me to be like, all right, well, let's give them a shot, yeah. you know? Um, and I'm glad they did. You know, I think they were happy with the outcome. I think the score turned out great. And I'm excited for everything else coming up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure, man. I, I'm, uh, that, that, that's a beautiful story, man. Like, I, I love that. that. That is a great, like, te- uh, a, a, a current technological L.A. story, right? It's just at the mm-hmm. right time at the right. Never <laughs> underestimate the power of connection through social media. Yeah. I'm just going to say that. You may think that, you know, some of these artists, they don't look at them or they have another team, but you'd be very surprised. Like even during the pandemic, I connected with some pretty big actors, actresses, other big directors, just by sending them a DM and telling them like how much I love their stuff. And I wasn't shooting over links to my reel, but having a personal (laughs) connection, you know, that's the number one thing. Like tell them what you like about it and why you want to connect and then from there they can make that decision to go further but at least you're not trying to take something from the jump yeah you know yeah. give something first and then they'll give you something yeah yeah mm-hmm. it's just approaching somebody it's like mr zimmer uh i'm a great violist and i think that i would be the <laughs> your number one chair in your next uh composition let's go yeah <laughs> Like, yeah, I think that's how it worked. Um, it it yeah. might have worked for somebody sometime in some place, but mm-hmm. it, it is weird when people just approach you and stuff. It's just like, okay, well, there's there's yeah. there's ways of doing this, and this is uncomfortable, and get away from me. <laughs> um, you know, cold emails and things like that. Like um, music supervisor, I know some people who I don't know if there's other music creators on here, but if you're sending emails, cold emails to a music supervisor provider or a library a lot of times they don't accept unsolicited material Mm. because of legal or legality you know or legal reasons so um they can't even review your material because Mm. it's in breach of something so you have to find the appropriate people who can and then forward they will forward on your behalf um through the acceptable routes to refer yeah you know yeah a lot of hurdles yeah but i mean it's like it's like anything right it's like if you're a gamer right uh you know like first level is is you, you gotta like struggle to go from level to level to level and as you get bigger and you get more experience and you get you know i you get the access to bigger and cooler projects uh which mm-hmm. which is which is great about this uh if you can be consistent and you can like you know show up on time and do your job and and you know know the right people you can do something cool and and it doesn't have to be like this huge superstar status thing you know like i i feel like that's just too much i would never want to be like this like rihanna you know it just must be terrible no, to be me. rihanna <laughs> <laughs> I, I like I've the, always said I want to be that person where I'm famous in my industry, yes. but no one bothers me. Exactly. You know, like if I ever get to the, like John Williams, he's so and obviously I'll never be that big, but like he, never say never. He's so I know it's true. <laughs> I, I believe in the power of manifestation. Let's go. Um he he um is a very private person, mm-hmm. you know, like he has all this prestige and everyone knows him, he's a household name, but you know, you don't see him doing a lot in the mm-hmm. public eye, you know. Maybe when there's a project he's mentioned, but besides that, he is away from the public, not wanting to talk to anyone. And I would love to have that. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you, man, because but you know, I appreciate the fandom and everything, but it can be very overwhelming, you mm-hmm. know, and, and take your attention away from things that you need exactly. to focus on. Exactly. Yeah. And and that to me, like the, the fact that John Williams is private and like just stays to himself, that to me shows work ethic as well, because if he's out gallivanting, drinking and partying with the stars and do it, how do you even get work done? That's what's so wild yeah. about that city is that, is that yeah. how do people even get this, get their work done? It's constantly sunny you know, like, like there's mm-hmm. always a party, you know, there's always a distraction somewhere 
because because it's constant that no one stops everyone's just go 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 um which is which is really funny that that like the west coast gets this laid back vibe you know i mean like because because there is i mean Uh even in los angeles there's sort of a, a laid back sort of thing going on but it's still a lot of tense like you know traffic uh everybody's just those fall oh, those f- no yeah it's terrible <laughs> you got you also got la that's on like fault lines you know so i feel like that energy mm-hmm. gets put out there too it, there's all kinds of wild crap that's going on out there but um man i i love southern california i mean it, you do you enjoy do you like living in southern california over like chicago Hell yes. I mean, I, <laughs> Chicago, the humidity, Ugh. not about it. I mean, after like 22 Ugh. years of that heat and humidity, I was out. So <sighs> even if I have to go to Miami, I, I remember for She Dreams at Sunrise when we had the premiere at Tribeca, I think that was 2021. It was one of the hottest heat waves in New York. Wow. It was awful. It was so humid. Swamp I was ass. wearing a suit and you're just sweating the whole time. And I'm like, you know what? Uh, I need to just go back to LA. It's... I just wanted to get back on the plane and go I back. Because I... it was just too much. Oh, dude. When when I would come home for Christmas, when I was still living in San Diego, I would come home for Christmas and it'd just be cold and horrible. And then I'd just be like, on that plane, like, just give me back. <laughs> give me back. Yeah. Now I'm back it's here. Really, it's really, like... really tough. So... No, I, um, I you did. You did ask something about inspiration because you yeah, mentioned yeah, yeah. something about Danny. I forgot to mention that. So yeah, I was hugely inspired mm-hmm. by Elfman. I mean, it's one of my favorite Batman scores, mm-hmm. um, and I actually have the full score of it. So oh. I was like studying that thing like a mother when um, wow. I was prepping mm-hmm. for the film. But also, I was uh, performing with Danny Elfman too. Oh, so um, all leading up to that. So, like, I was the principal violist for the Coachella tour that he did. And oh, also, I saw um, that performance. That was the, wild. Oh yeah, the Hollywood Bowl show as well. Um, um, so I was literally surrounded by Danny Elfman mm. for months before writing the wow. score. So I feel like he his music uh, was a direct reflection. Um, in my score, but I also feel like it's unique in a sense, too. I was inspired by Elfman, but also Elliot Goldenthal and, you know, the original OG that people don't really know about, Shirley Walker, hmm. uh, who did the animated series, which everyone loves the music from that. Oh, yeah. She she was the main composer from that, and she was a huge, um, you know, huge, uh, I guess, beacon of the sound of hmm. Batman. You know, I think uh, Shirley worked with Elfman on orchestrating some of the stuff for the soundtrack. I think um, along with Steve uh, Bartek and his other people on his team. But um, yeah, that it's crazy because at that time, women composers weren't really in the forefront. But she yeah. definitely was. And she she definitely deserves to be talked about more mm. because her music's incredible. So I think it was a marriage of all of that. A little bit of Hans, a little bit of James Newton Howard, and a little bit of myself. A lot of bit of myself, I of should course. say, mm-hmm. <laughs> since I wrote it. But um, but yeah, I just really wanted to stay true to that sound. You know, like we all know what Batman sounds like, even if the melodies change. It has to have that sound world that's dark and brooding, but majestic and really epic. Mm. You know, and so since the film was kind of, I know you haven't seen it, mm. so. I don't, um, it's not your traditional Batman film. So if you're going there expecting it to be like, you know, another typical Batman, you may leave like, what? But it's very Lovecraftian, very um, fantasy elements of horror. So the score kind of touches base in that, in this like fantasy horror type of score versus your big theatrical Batman soundtrack right and and this is going off a book too right there was books did you end up reading it's a three-part comic series i think yeah Uh, i did i actually through um a little bit of it oh cool um i thought it would be important to kind of know from the source material where we're going with this but the you know the the film follows the books as closely as it could uh to the point where they did have to be you know make considerations for the film to make it more updated and what you know what 
audiences today would want to see. Mm. So I think for the most part, they tried to stay true to what Mike Vignola um, and Richard Pace did in the comics. Uh, but it does have some few twists there, and there's a lot of Easter eggs in it with characters that you are familiar with that may not be so familiar mm. anymore, if that makes sense, without giving too many things away. <laughs> right on. No, that, that's rad, man. That's really cool. And, and now, were you a, a fan of Batman going into this? I was. I mean, I've always been a fan of Batman. Mm. Um, for me, I wasn't a big comic person, mm. to be honest with you. So, like, it took me a little time to be like, all right, let me sit down with this and, like, read it through. And Because I feel like comics, you have to really be a fan to, like, be into them. Mm. And, like, the way that the style that you w- read through and immerse yourself in the environment, it, it requires a lot of imagination. And I'm such a visual a moving visual person <laughs> so uh for me i can get a little um you know bored by comics but for this comic there was so much going on that you're just kind of like whoa what's going to happen next so right. when they made the film um it was just very interesting to see it all come to life yeah, sure man it's uh th- i mean it's it's always weird right these these uh interpretation these movie interpretations like um, I, I I loved comic books. I collected comic books when I was a kid, so I I, I got you know I love them. Um, but man, like these uh, these MCU movies, these Marvel movies, to me it's gotten so over the top, and I just I can't even I just can't even like go to them anymore. Like I want to see the new Galaxy Gardens of the Galaxy, but like I don't know, man. Some of these <laughs> it's just too much for me at this point. Like I've kind of lost interest in uh in, in watching movies and stuff like that and, and even TV shows. There's a few TV shows that I watch, but like really all I just wanna do is 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 like create and and <laughs> doom scroll on TikTok. <laughs> so it's a great waste of time. Um so th- this Batman um it, for for the composition, you're using uh, what what software are you using? Um, like what DAW were you using, and then what was your orchestra software or plugins? Um, I use Logic Pro mm. for scoring. Um, I know some people like Cubase, but I I kind of love Logic for what it does, and I also hate it, but love it more <laughs> than hate. Um, and as far as like sample libraries, I use a lot of different ones. Mm. Um, I'm kind of particular with my instruments because I'm so used to playing in the orchestra. So I kind of know the sound. So right. when, I, when I hit a note and it just doesn't sound right, like I go relentlessly in there adjusting the attacks and releases and like EQing things so it sounds more realistic. But I find that the libraries that I gravitate to the most would be Cine samples uh, strings um, mm. in combination with performance samples um, strings, Legato library. I forgot the name of that library, but it's, um, I think the performance samples uh, library for me sounds extremely realistic but you have to tweak it because there's so many inconsistencies with it. Um, and they they acknowledge that. They're like, hey, this sounds fantastic, but you're gonna have to work with the kinks. Mm. Um, and, and so layering those two on top of one another created the strings that you kind of hear now. Yeah. Um, they're pretty lush and kind of driven and they're kind of in your face, but they don't sound extremely fake, yeah. if that makes sense. It does. Um, yeah, and brass. Um, a lot of it, a lot of it was cine samples. To be honest with you, I think I used a little bit of East West, um, uh, some of the East West brass libraries as well. Um, and then I kind of experimented with making some of my own instruments as well. There was one that I needed to do um, that kind of was reminiscent of the big bell in the in the bell tower that I wanted to capture mm. and one of use and so i went in and kind of tweaked the sample that i created of a bell chime and like dropped it many octaves and added all these filters on it so when it hits like you kind of just feel it in the room yeah versus it like a bell strike so there was just a lot of like trying to create different sounds that are unique to the film but also using sample libraries that are like my go-to's for orchestration 
Oh, that's sweet, man. Um, the what was your what was your uh, time limit on this? Or what was that? What, ugh, man, I'm sorry, my brain's not working good. But what was uh, what was your deadline like from start to finish? How much time did you have to do this? Well, originally we started. Uh, it started early because animation can take some time. Right. Um, so we didn't have re really have a locked cut until much later in the process. So I'm trying to think realistically, like scoring the full movie, probably about less than two months. Mm. Wow. Um, because it's a lot of music to write. Yeah. And in that 90 months, minutes, my God. Yeah, and that two months you have to, you know, there's several rounds of previews where, you know, you may only have three weeks to write the first act of the film, which mm. could be 35 minutes of music on its own. Um, and so you have to write that, then present that to the producer and the team. They have to provide their critique. And if there's any revisions, then you have to revise while also writing the next reel. <laughs> um, and then, you know, the next reel and revising two reels at the same time wow. while finishing the last reel. So um, it involves a big team of yeah. people. You know, um, For this situation, I think I wrote a lot of times with these, these types of films, composers will have, a, like I said, the team and they'll have additional writers. Some, if they're not cool, they'll have ghost writers. I don't condone that, but <laughs> give people credit. <laughs> um, but you have a team where you can farm out different cues to one another. And so if I want if I wanted to work in that fashion, then I could be like, Hey, I'm going to do all of the major cues in the film. And then I'll have someone additional writers take the, some of the underscore stuff and some, you know, some of the smaller things so I can really focus on that. But in this situation, I was afraid that having additional writers on too many of the cues would take away from the overall sound because I already kind of established the sound and not everyone has the same libraries as you, the same plugin. So mm -hmm. there's just so many variations since we weren't recording with an orchestra that could make the score kind of sound like who the hell wrote that <laughs> cue, you know? <laughs> so I wanted to prevent that. And, and maybe that was a little too micromanaging, but I think I, out of the entire score, only about two minutes, uh, there's about two and a half minutes that, it was not written by me, yeah. but the rest of it was written wow. and produced and recorded that, by me. Do, do you feel like that in the midst of it, did you feel like you're a little bit in over your head because you were taking oh, out I so much? I feel like that in every project, to be <laughs> honest. As soon as you see that blank screen, you're like, oh, man, what am I supposed to <laughs> You just see all this video on the timeline and you, you get... I think every composer kind of goes through that imposter syndrome mm -hmm. complex, but it's like you have to know when to turn it off. I think it's healthy to have it in the beginning because it kind of um, it kind of helps you become a little more inspired in your research uh, to try to find an answer that'll work, at least for me. Yeah. Um, but you have to get out of it ASAP because that deadline doesn't change. Right. So right. You know, the longer you're in woe is me, the worse the situation becomes. You know, so it, you it, can pity a little bit and get to work. It, it really does come down to just like just start doing it, right? Like just like it, whatever it is, because the great thing about DAWs is that you can erase, you can delete. So mm -hmm. like if it's not working, but like just starting somewhere, I think starting yeah. is what freaks people out the most. Is is looking at a huge project, and be like, oh god. And, you know, yeah. like just trying to get yourself to get there. But what's interesting about it, if you really love what you do, is that once you are in it, you're just sort of it, you're transported and like you're fixated on this one thing. And then you remember it's like, oh, yeah, this is fun, right? Like, this is, <laughs> I like doing this for the most part. Yeah. There, there's some projects that I've had where I'm just like, I don't. I don't like this. <laughs> I don't like doing this, <laughs> but I really need this money, so I'm just gonna do this. Uh, I think the closer you get to the deadline, the happier you become. Mm. You know, so it's it's um, for film scoring. It's just, it, it can be very daunting, you know, because you you have to separate yourself from the music sometimes. Like when I submit a cue in, I have to realize like I'm writing this for the production. Yeah. So I have to let my ego go. I have to let everything go. Because when I get notes back, I may think the cue works perfectly for the scene. 
but the director can just be like, trash that. I don't like it at all. And you have to start over and create something new. Wow. And if you get into your emotions about that, it can easily become a very dark place, yeah. you know? And I think it's, I think we all go through that, but as far as film scoring in general, you really have to have a thick skin and you have to be able to disconnect yourself emotionally from your music, which can, kind of seems counterintuitive, okay. you know? Um, but you become more connected to it once you see approval at the top and you're like, Oh, okay. <laughs> oh yeah. This is great. Thank <laughs> you. Moving on. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Right. Well, no. Yeah, exactly. Because you're, because at the end of the day, when you're making music for a film, like you are still like working as a part of a team and, and people have to approve it. And, and you, you could sit there and try to like, you know, hold your ground, but like, what is that going to get you other than a bad reputation that you're hard to work with, right? Exactly. So it's, you know, it's, it's a catch. Well, and, and if you don't like constructive criticism, don't do. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't do art in that. general, right? Like, don't do, really? don't do any really? kind of art because it, if you can't take any kind of, uh, you know, criticism of any kind, like then. You know, it is not going to work for you. <laughs> this is yeah. This is not going to happen. And like you were saying, at the end of the day, it really comes down to them paying you money for an asset. You mm -hmm. know, just like if you were working on a video game and people are creating assets for the game, you don't own that material afterwards. I mean, we get if it's a studio film, you get credited as the writer, and obviously for copyright purposes and PRO. Um, things you get your appropriate percentages for that but it becomes ip of the studio so yeah. they want to make sure that this ip is exactly what they need so yeah. if you view it in that sense then you become less emotionally attached and just say okay this is an asset that they are purchasing from me versus this is my masterpiece you know like <laughs> yeah. separate your commission your personal projects from your work right and when you do that you'll be much happier yeah i yeah that 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 was one thing that i had to learn it and and it just you you because you're gonna you drive yourself nuts if you if you really hold yeah. on to that kind of mentality and uh mm -hmm. And I feel like you put yourself in this like weird little like victim mentality where you're like, oh, why is, you know, I no one wants to work with me. Oh, why is everybody so mean to me? And like, it's like, no, you're just, you're just, you know, and of course it, it's, uh, we're musicians, we're artists and we're emotional about our shit, right? We get, we get upset. We get attached to things. There are children, but um, what, who said that? It was like, you got to kill your kids, kill the baby or something. It's like, uh, he's like, you got to learn to like kill your children because it's uh, um, in the business itself. Because, you know, you're going to you're going to think this is the greatest thing in the world. But, you know, the producer is like, no, that don't work. Start over. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the best part is when they say it doesn't work, then you do something else and then they come back to the idea that actually that you did the first time and then it's finally approved, but you had to write three other versions before they got back to them. So that happens too. <laughs> <laughs> He's making a million, million, uh, revisions. Hey, Michael Allen, CPA. Thank you for that raid with your friends. Welcome in everybody. I appreciate y'all. Uh, we are talking with Stefan L. Smith, who is a, uh, composer a violist and uh, everybody, make sure you go follow Michael and uh, make sure you follow his boss, uh, Goat versus Fish, who is a tyrant. He's stern but fair. So go make sure that you give Michael a follow and, of course, his boss, uh, Goat versus Fish, um, who uh, I still say Goat for life. Goat for <laughs> life. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I, I usually do like a, a raid song, but our guest today has a time limit, so I'm not going to do it right now, but I will do it after our guest leaves. But I love you guys. Thank you so much for the raid. And now we're back over to Stefan here. Uh, so you were mentioning that, uh, that, that, you know, like having uh, representation. And I was just, I was curious if you were, um, if, if, how you felt about like, cause there's a big controversy right now, especially with the little mermaid, right. With the new little mermaid and her being, oh, how do you, how do you, how, well, how do you see that when you, when you have like tradition, because I, I think we're about the same age. So we, 
we came up with the original Little Mermaid and Ariel, and and we came up, you know, with Lion King and all that stuff. What? How do you feel about them sort of going back and changing these iconic characters for today? It's it's a loaded question. I feel like people are very connected mm-hmm. to, you know, nostalgia. Right. You know, uh, when we see something, we grew up with it. We don't want it to change. That's that's how it was, and that's how it needs to be. And some people feel that, uh, you know, you don't have to change it. You can do a spinoff, and and if you do the spinoff, then you can elaborate or change things, but you're not affecting the original idea. But what people don't realize at the end of the day, and maybe I'm just too logical or literal, it's Disney's IP. They can do whatever the hell they want. Okay. Like yeah. end of the day. Yeah. So they want to change the characters to everyone, Asian, Arab, whatever they want to do, they can do it because the story is theirs to do it and it, and it can be changed in any way. I think it's, I think it's cool that they offered this version mm-hmm. of it. It's not the same, but at the same time, do we want to keep creating the same thing over and over? I think it's okay to push that envelope. Mm-hmm. So I have no problem with it. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm biased, um, but other people have talked to me about it um, with other films too, uh, where they like change a character and now they're gay, or they change the character or something. And it's just like, why do you care? You know, like <laughs> it, like honestly, like why do you? It, it, is it entertaining to you? Is it affecting your life that much to where they own the IP of this and want to change it and flip the script? I mean, it's their story to tell, yeah. right? I I hundred percent so, agree with you. I, I mean, it's it's not. That's how I feel. Well, and you know, people. <laughs> no, no, and that's fair. And and I understand that it is a loaded question because either way, you're mm-hmm. going to be wrong to somebody, right? It's like, no, fuck that. My yeah. my childhood is better. <laughs> I mean, it means more to me than anything else. So you need to make sure that yeah. you create according to my childhood. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, you're right. The, the you don't own that, you know. Like, and and as consumers, we do kind of feel like we own some art, right? Like uh, everybody has like a little piece into it because we all sort of either paid the ticket or or we all decide we're gonna listen to this and a bunch of you know. So it sort of does become part of uh, the 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 milieu or whatever. It becomes yeah. part of the lexicon the of public repertoire. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> but but yeah, I. Don't who gives a shit like it, i'm sure that young ladies didn't do a great job and um, i know. know she is i mean i've seen some you know some clips and things yeah. like that and i've heard the music or some of the music and it sounds incredible and i mean they do this on broadway all the time no one mm. plays yeah you know yeah. so yeah. why is it that we put a camera in front and we change things now everyone's I rate. Everybody's you know? losing their damn mind. Yeah, it happens all the time with leads and understudies yeah. and whatever, yeah. and and they may be a different hue, and they may have a different timbre in their voice, and they, but that's okay. Like you're you're changing the story a little bit and making it new. I don't see anything wrong with it. You know, yeah, me um, neither. Unless they don't do a good job, but I right. heard she did a fantastic job. So. I tell you, I tell you one thing that did bother me about Aladdin was that they added mm-hmm. a brand new song, which again they do that on Broadway oh. too. They added a brand new song, and I'm just like, what is this? Okay, like <laughs> I get it. Like make your changes. I don't care, but you're adding new music just to, for women I think power. They did which... that for several, right? Didn't they yeah, I think the so. Lion King. And, I, I think you're um, right. I think yeah. Oh, it yeah, was Lion King. Was the it? audience? I think it was the Lion King that did it. Anyways, but yeah, yeah, it, it, it was like Beyonce. Was yes, it was the Beyonce King, song. So even having Beyonce attached, she had her own album mm-hmm. that was not the Lion King soundtrack, but inspired by it and mm-hmm. Afrobeat inspired and mm-hmm. stuff. That was completely different from the original, <laughs> uh, you know. And then they had new cues in it, you know. Yeah. So that that soundtrack's one of my favorite soundtracks growing up. Obviously, Hans Zimmer, but I actually had the luxury to record on that. Oh, score oh sweet for like two weeks with Hans Zimmer in the orchestra and it was fantastic and mm. yes things changed but even visually it changed some people didn't like that it was live action and they wanted it to be a cartoon again and like <laughs> why does it have to be it's like because they own it yeah that's why yeah they they want it to appeal to a younger audience uh who 
let's face it, younger kids are not watching 2D cartoons as much as they used to. Yeah. You know, we grew up with 2D cartoons, you know, and we loved it. But when the, when it switched to 3D and other types of animation styles, kids now are bored, you know. <laughs> they want something that almost looks realistic. I mean, look at the PS5. It's like I'm playing someone's life when I turn on a video game. Yeah. It literally feels like I'm playing a real life simulator. So I just think they're trying to move with that time and also make things fresh. So I know it can be annoying to some people, but it doesn't bother me. <laughs> and yeah, no, it doesn't bother me. I was just like, why are they adding song? That was the only thing I was just like, this is bullshit. Like, that's not the song. But <laughs> but again, who cares? Like, it, it really doesn't yeah. matter. None of it really is worth, like, getting on Twitter and trying to, like, you know, rule someone's oh, yeah. day. I, mean, I saw some crazy things about, you know, the new Ariel um, <laughs> on Twitter and just i was like really you guys are this pressed <laughs> like it's affecting your life that much <laughs> all right black ariel it's killing me <laughs> yeah you know and some of the memes and i i mean it was just ridiculous i was like yeah. good old marica doing what it does best <laughs> well the um, memes the memes that i thought were funny was when they started changing all like a bunch of people um they were <laughs> I just saw oh, a tiktok yeah. video where the dude's laughing about and where they replace all the black people and or re replace everybody with black people and oh my god i can't remember you know because my memory's terrible but mm -hmm. it, it's hilarious it, it, i mean it's funny mm -hmm. But it's making a broader point, right? But it, it's yeah. I don't know. It, it, to me as well, I don't. I don't really care. It does nothing to me. It doesn't hurt my feelings. It doesn't. You know, it doesn't make me angry. Um. So yeah. you you won an award for uh she dreams is the, what's the name of the what was it she dreams she dreams at sunrise. There you go. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That that uh, that's yep. interesting, man. That in and, and what kind of? Because I, I have no idea what that is, but we we gotta we'll pull it up here. Yeah, well, uh, she dreams at sunrise is a short animated film that was directed and uh, basically created by Cameron Johnson. He's a really good friend of my, mine and Fresh. a very talented director, but also owns an animation studio. Oh, really? um, and Tribeca basically reached out to him to uh, be part of um, a series that basically was commemorating the death of George Floyd. Uh, I think it's the eight minute, 47 seconds film series. Mm. So uh, several directors were invited to produce films that were around eight minutes and 47 seconds commemorating the time that it took, you know, for him to pass. Mm -hmm. um, and this film was one of them. Um, it's animated and, and the challenge of it was that it basically has no dialogue i think there's about 30 seconds of actual dialogue so the entire film is my music and so i had to capture everything with the music that was going on as well as um you know we ended up recording it with an orchestra so um i think it, it i think it did a very good job telling the story and um and the award was just another awesome thing to win on top of it uh, to be able to just kind of showcase the film for what it is. It's a beautiful story. I don't want to give too much away, mm -hmm. um, but it hit home with me just dealing with uh, things in my family of just aging parents and taking care of them and just being kind of like a caretaker with someone who needs that type of help. So, yeah. and interesting enough, it connected with my partner whose art is in back of me that you can see. Oh, right. uh, my partner, Ryan Colby, uh, Goberdon, he he uh we actually met at tribeca he was at the screening and i flew out to la and i saw him at the after party and that's how we met and we just kept talking and we're still together to this day but oh. had i not gone to the tribeca festival i would have never met him mm. um and i and had i never scored this film i would have never met him. so Aww. it kind of is a nice little thing that brought us all together cameras my my partner and and other people at Tribeca, all of that. It was all done because of She Dreams of Sunrise. So I love this film. Oh my God. And I think most people who'll see it will love it. I love that so much. That is such a great story. <laughs> that is so Thank nice. You. That is just so nice. <laughs> Everyone's uh, like, it's a movie. You guys need to make it into a movie. Because uh, I, I actually was not supposed to even go to the premiere. I had a, 
um, I had a performance the night before that I was leading. Um, and I took a bow on stage and my agent was like, you better get your ass to New York. Like that film is all your music. You need to be there. And it's Tribeca. So mm. I got a red eye, flew out, barely in sleep, went to the festival, saw the screening and then ended up being an incredible weekend. I'm just glad I decided to, you know, bite the bullet and just go because I was two seconds away from going home and passing out and going to bed for the weekend. <laughs> oh, man. So, the, yeah, it's all about the it's all about the things that you, you I I always get those mixed up. All about the chances you didn't take or did take. I don't know. Who cares? That, that's nice. You got to be up there. What's a what, both, both. Yeah. What's a what's a good way you were talking about, you know, networking and stuff and and as someone who, you know, worked their way up through the ranks here, what was like one of the big networking things where you found that like, and what's your strategy on it? Which sounds kind of weird, but like, you know, you should have some sort of strategy when it comes to your career in life. Um, but it just sounds like you're using people, but that's not it. You're literally just making a connection to other people. <laughs> um, so what what was some of the ways that you found that was the best way for you to sort of start networking within a city like at Los Angeles? Well, I think... Um just getting out to events like i was saying you know um a lot of times if you if you're a musician um joining different organizations will allow you to meet people they have mixers either if they're online or in person mm. one of which you know if you're a person uh of color and you're a composer there's the composers diversity collective mm. which was founded several years back that has some pretty big names michael abels is attached to that and Amanda Jones, Michael Abels did the music for Nope and Get Out and, okay. uh, and, and Us and things like that. Oh, that's right. um, um, and Chris Bowers is also uh, a part of that collective too, which he's done Bridgerton and several other big projects. Um, and so through that, you just meet people and they mm. like, hey, we may need an additional composer or like, hey, I can't do this project. Would you want me to recommend you for it? And like, it's like a society that, yeah, you pay something, what is it, 200 bucks for the year, just like you would if you were a member of the Society of Composers or Lyrists or any of these organizations that are meant to help you network and, and make solid connections. So it takes you away from the computer screen of cold emailing and just meeting people. Mm -hmm. So going to festivals, going to, you know, uh, Comic Con, what it, it you know, all these different things allow you to go to events where you can meet people and make solid connections and friendships. Yeah. You know, even when I used to go to GDC in San Francisco, um, the Game Developers Conference, um, and it was so much fun because it was like the geekiest thing in the world, and I'm totally a geek. Uh, but it, it's a whole new level of geek. I'll just say that, <laughs> um, like a whole massive dance floor of people like fist pumping the 8-bit music was a little too much for me but i loved it and i was surrounded by that and you just never know who you're gonna meet there yeah you know uh yeah, you could be dancing right next to somebody who's like one of the lead game developers at ubisoft or yeah or you know konami or anything like that and you guys are just drinking and having a conversation and next thing you know you're sending each other info and they're emailing you in a few weeks so yeah. it's just getting out there you know was that um and if you're not in la it's a little harder yes. you know was that something that was difficult for you i mean you seem like you like your your alone time or at least you know not being around a bunch of people all the time um which i might be wrong but uh was that something was that something that you had a hurdle that you had to get past within yourself i think uh the amount of time i allotted to it i had to adjust no. you know because if you do it too often it could be overwhelming but mm. also if you do it often you could become more comfortable with it yes you know so you have to find that equilibrium where you're doing it enough to where you can be an honest representation of, of yourself or represent uh yeah representative of yourself <laughs> um in the moment because so many people get in their head when they're networking and they're like what do i talk about what should i say blah blah, blah. but the more that you do it the easier it just becomes second nature so mm. I, I i think now 
I've become more of a hermit just because of deadlines and things I have to get done. So I have to be very selective about what I'm going to. But before, when I had plenty of time, I was twirling all over the universe trying to make connections, you know? <laughs> for sure. So uh, you do what you got to do. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You got to push. You got to push. There's no way. Mm -hmm. I mean, because artists can be pretty introverted and... And it's it, it, it's hard, especially for me. I used drugs and alcohol for a long time to get past it, but once the drugs, <laughs> yeah. which is which is not the best way to do things, but it is a way. Uh, I mostly just made a bad name for myself. But <laughs> but as soon as I got sober and stuff, it, it was this. I I had to really push to like go out to. To, to go see a band or something and go, you know, talk to people. Even sending texts and emails were like crazy for me. So it's literally you just got to push through it. And then, you know, it gets easier and easier like anything else, really. Um, so uh, yeah. I, I, I know, Stefan, thank you so much for coming on here. I, I learned so much and uh, I, I appreciate you sharing yeah, no your you your life and your experiences with us. Uh, I have been asking everybody... Uh, what, what's the best piece of advice you've ever gotten? Which is a hard question. Hmm. That's really difficult. <laughs> best piece of advice I've ever gotten. I, I got another question. If you, if that one's too hard. <laughs> which? Yeah, that one's hard. What's another one? <laughs> I have to think about that. Do baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is, do babies do babies who are baptized go to heaven or hell oh my god i'm sorry i don't i don't know i was a raised catholic so yeah. is baptismal like very important in the christian or catholic church? most most um, christians I yeah, don't know. if there is a heaven and hell and if there is a god let's just premise it like that do babies i don't I don't think so. <laughs> no, they kind of cast them off into the fires of hell. They all go to heaven. They don't have any. They don't have a choice. Come on, let's and just send them to heaven. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Well, we'll, we'll yeah. end with we'll <laughs> end with that. A positive note. Babies and puppies all go to heaven. Okay, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Stefan, thank you so much for your time, my friend. Uh, please, if you ever want to come on for any reason, just hit me up. You, uh, you're an absolute pleasure to awesome. talk to. Everybody, please put your hands together okay, so. for today's guest. Yeah. Stefan L. Smith! Everybody, give him love! Thank you, sir. Gosh. Thank you, Stefan. I'll talk to you later, bro. There goes Stefan. I know, that was stupid, wasn't it? <laughs> Do 